Okay, so uh, thank you everyone. So um, this week uh, we are going to have um, a discussion, a discussion with um, Rado. Rado is our um, DHIS2 uh, infrastructure DevOps engineer. Uh, they have um, instances of DHIS2 that um, that basically are for development and even uh, uh, our infrastructure. So he's part of the team that does the, um, support the same infrastructure and they have um, interesting uh, setup um, architecture. So today we want to um, uh, have him take us through uh, what we have uh, and the technologies that they are using in their in, uh, in the uh, infrastructure. And um, Moses, uh, sorry, Rado, uh, welcome. And um, that is a quick introduction about him. So uh, he'll just um, guess if he has anything uh, or slides or what, but he's going to give us a brief introduction of uh, what we have. And again, you know, uh, after that, we can ask questions if we have any. Yeah, thank you. Welcome, Brad. Uh, thanks, Tito. Uh, yeah, hey guys, my name is uh, Radu Ivanov. I'm just uh, one of the DevOps engineers uh, working in the DHS2 development team. And uh, today I did uh, <clears throat> prepare a small presentation for you guys. Uh, hopefully we can... Uh, <clears throat> We can uh, have uh, good discussions uh, throughout the, the presentations and uh, after it. And um, I guess I'll try to share my screen now. Um, uh, can you guys uh, see my screen? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about the DHS2 infrastructure and uh, more specifically our internal uh, development infrastructure that is used by the development team for, for testing, development, um, uh, demoing uh, new features and so on. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> As I said, the, the DHS2 infrastructure is indeed uh, all, the, all the servers, all the services that we administer. Um, and uh, I'm going to also talk about some of the challenges uh, that uh, we've had in the past with the infrastructure and uh, we still do to some extent. And uh, <clears throat> I'm also, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, some of the latest uh, initiatives that uh, we've been embarking on. And uh, in particular, this is uh, the push to uh, have most of uh, our infrastructure as code. Um, talking, I will also talk about uh, the, the uh, challenges and uh, uh, new things we have with uh, moving DHS to in Docker and uh, running in Kubernetes. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, what is uh, our DHS to infrastructure? Uh, as you can see, we have uh, a lot of things uh, that we administer. We have uh, test instances, uh, a lot of uh, demo instances. Uh, Again, a lot of training instances. Uh, only some of these are, are public facing, so you would be familiar only with uh, probably like uh, play.dhs2.org or maybe demos.dhs2.org. But we do have a lot of servers that we uh, use internally uh, for the things that I already mentioned, like uh, testing, development, um, demoing, and so on. Uh, other notable services that uh, we administer on our own is AppHub, or maybe it's also known as apps. Uh, this is apps.dhs2.org, where we host um, 
of the DHS2 uh, front-end applications about custom and developed by us. Uh, we also have a internal Jenkins server that we administer and uh, run on our own infrastructure and uh, by our own, I actually mean on AWS, but uh, it's all uh, internally managed. Uh, other things that you might uh, be familiar with is the releases.dhs.org website where you can download uh, any number of uh, <clears throat> more artifacts of the DHS2 application. Uh, databases.dhs.org where we uh, distribute uh, the <clears throat> uh, the Sierra Loan uh, testing database that is uh, kind of widely accepted as the uh, DHS2 uh, testing or development uh, database, or at least uh, the most uh, used one. Um, and the documentation, of course, docs.dhs2.org. Uh, some other services that we do use but do not administer ourselves is, of course, uh, a GitHub. Uh, GitHub. Um, <clears throat> we recently moved from uh, our own hosted Jira to Jira on the cloud. So this is now in the uh, hosted services uh, section. We also use browser stack, uh, or rather, we did use browser stack, but uh, I listed it here. Uh, as it's still uh, <clears throat> as it's still there in some places, uh, we do use uh, Netlify for for testing uh, front end applications, and uh, the dhs 2org website itself um, it's not hosted uh, on our own infrastructure. It's hosted by an external company, and we pretty much just provide the content there. Um, so some of the challenges uh, that we've had and still have is mainly the, <clears throat> the amount of uh, servers and uh, DHS2 instances that uh, we have to keep around for people to be able to test, develop, and uh, see the new features that we have been working on. Um, <clears throat> we have servers running on, on AWS, uh, on OpenStack, and uh, as well as some physical machines that uh, are hosted on <clears throat> some hosting platform, but uh, are physical machines and not uh, cloud platforms. And on these uh, hosting and uh, cloud platforms, we have uh, a lot, a lot of servers. Uh, I've only mentioned play and demos here because these are kind of the most uh, widely known uh, public facing ones. But we have uh, about 23 or 25, I think, uh, servers uh, <clears throat> that we keep around, uh, all spread across uh, AWS and OpenStack, as well as the physically hosted ones. And uh, on the screenshot uh, on the right, you can see this is a screenshot of play.dhs2.org. You can see that currently we have, uh, what is this, uh, four, seven, and five, that's 12. Uh, 12 DHS2 instances running on that server. So you can imagine that we do have a lot of DHS2 instances running on the 25 servers that we keep. It's uh, in the hundreds, um, maybe nearing 200 at this point. So you can imagine that this is uh, quite challenging to, to maintain, to, to keep secure, and uh, just to keep running in general, uh, because um, yeah, it's a lot of servers. Uh, as I said, uh, the main challenge with uh, running so much uh, instances on the number of servers that we have uh, is uh, <clears throat> is the maintenance, and uh, particularly like uh, operating system updates, uh, uh, package and software updates that uh, have been provisioned on those uh, servers. Um, Plugin updates. Uh, also, it's a big challenge to to have uh, user and uh, policy <clears throat> administration on all these uh, servers. Uh, basically, who can SSH where, who can see what, and so on. Um, it's also a challenge to 
uh, keep tabs on the disk space uh, that is being used uh, when it's uh, going down, when it's uh, actually <clears throat> um, uh, when it's actually all full and so on. Uh, same goes uh, about the memory. And uh, of course, uh, with <clears throat> the latest uh, DHS2 versions, uh, we've been kind of changing the, the development workflow. And uh, now we have uh, some new uh, processes and uh, workflows and that uh, we would like uh, enter trying to support. Uh, basically, we are <clears throat> trying to shift toward testing uh, of uh, each pull request in the, instead of uh, testing uh, full features or uh, full releases. This uh, basically means that uh, we we'll want to have uh, a new DHS2 instance running for each pull request that you create so that uh, the people that are supposed to test it can <clears throat> focus on just the, the given changes uh, there. And it's uh, not requiring a long running uh, server that you have to update constantly. Uh, also, we want to have uh, and actually have some very realistic environments uh, <clears throat> compared to some of the implementations uh, of DHS2 across the world, uh, mainly for, for kind of uh, performance uh, bench benchmarking. Uh, we've been helping uh, a lot of implementations with uh, uh, performance and uh, <clears throat> scalability um, improvements and, uh, and issues across the years. Um, we do use a lot of uh, large databases uh, that need a lot of resources to run. So this is a, a challenge on its own. And uh, for the re realistic environments, we also use them for, for demos and functional testing because uh, sometimes issues do arise when you have a very kind of test dedicated environment. That's not really uh, what's uh, out there. So you can have unexpected results when you actually deploy it uh, somewhere that people actually use it. And uh, <clears throat> recently there has been a big push with the metadata packages. A lot of new metadata packages are being developed and released. So this uh, is another challenge, uh, another challenge that we are um, working uh, on, improving and uh, <coughs> making better. And um, yes, before jumping into infrastructure as code, uh, I suppose I can ask if somebody has any questions, if uh, you would guys want me to kind of go deeper on any of the things that I've uh, went through. And if not, I'll just uh, continue to infrastructure as code. Okay, I'll take this as a no. So infrastructure as code, why do we use uh, and what is the <clears throat> reason that we want to have our infrastructure written as code? Um, one of the main reasons is uh, reproducibility. Um, <clears throat> if uh, your infrastructure is written as code, you can easily recreate it, uh, either the whole thing, let's say a whole uh, cluster, a whole server, a whole service uh, like AppHub, or just uh, parts of it that you want to update and so on, which uh, minimizes uh, the risk factor and also the fear of updating and potentially breaking something. It also really helps with uh, scalability. You can create any number of copies easily of the infrastructure models that uh, you have created. For example, you can create a, a production, a staging, a testing environment that is absolutely the same with just uh, maybe different uh, names or slight changes in configuration. Uh, it also helps with uh, having your infrastructure be immutable. Uh, so 
Um, we, <clears throat> everywhere where we have uh, infrastructure as code, we do not do kind of in place um, updates and upgrades. If something has to be updated, it's usually uh, all destroyed and then uh, brought up uh, from from scratch again uh, when there's uh, something that we need to to change and this as the same goes uh, treat your servers like cattle not pets maybe this is a bit uh, offensive to the servers but uh, they can take it and uh, of course consistency um, <clears throat> it's very easy to make uh, human errors when you're uh, <clears throat> when you have your infrastructure uh, dependent on uh, some manual interaction, basically either clicking around uh, on AWS or maybe running some scripts individually. Uh, it's easy to, to make a mistake and uh, maybe later it's hard to understand what actually went wrong. So infrastructure as code really helps with uh, consistency and having uh, identical environments. <clears throat> Uh, also, version control. Um, you can, you know, already, I suppose, know the benefits of uh, version controlling your code, and the same benefits goes for the infrastructure as code concept. You can go back in time and see uh, what was changed, who changed it. Uh, maybe if you want to go back and so on, uh, this makes it much easier. And yeah, <clears throat> it, infrastructure is called just in general removes the manual labor of creating uh, things on the cloud or on physical servers and uh, kind of minimizes uh, or eliminates user errors. Uh, now <clears throat> I want to briefly talk. Uh, a bit about Docker. I've uh, outlined some very basic Docker best practices, and um, I'll talk about them in a second. But I just wanted to say that uh, we've been pushing toward uh, running <coughs> DHS2 internally, uh, exclusively in Docker, and. Uh, I can't say that we are done at this point. Uh, we still have uh, work to do, but uh, it's a big journey. So <clears throat> it does take a, a lot of time. And um, running your application in Docker, as you may know, has a lot of benefits, but it's also kind of uh, challenging to, to get it uh, done right. Uh, uh, <clears throat> yes, Gerald? Um, did you have a question or just uh, testing your mic? Okay, I'll take this as testing your mic. Um, so some of the best practices that we, <clears throat> and these are very basic best practices, of course, the, the list is non-exhaustive. If you just Google Docker best practices, you'll get a lot more information on the topic. Uh, I suppose uh, some or most of you guys are already familiar with this, but uh, these are kind of the things that uh, are foundational and we uh, and we build everything based on that. Uh, very important for us is that we don't run uh, our containers or images as root. So this really improves uh, security and uh, <clears throat> So Gerald is saying that he cannot hear anymore. Can somebody just confirm that uh, they can still hear and it's maybe just Gerald that cannot hear? I can hear you. Uh, yes, okay, you can hear. so yeah, I can hear you. Okay, well, sorry, Gerald. I, I suppose you can watch the recording later. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, we do not run the root anymore. We did run our images. Uh, oh, perfect, nice. Uh, we did run our uh, very old images as root before, but this is no longer the case. And uh, we're kind of uh, proud of that. Um, we do not run, uh, actually we do run our uh, application as process ID one. 
which basically means that uh, this is the the only process that is running within the container and this is kind of a a must do for for docker containers uh, if you want to have multiple services running in your container then it's maybe better to split it in <clears throat> multiple containers uh, it's a very good idea to have simple docker files or in our case we actually no longer have a docker file at all uh, we use jeep uh, i have provided a link here but i'm not going to open it right now uh, jeep is a uh, i guess a tool developed by by google uh, it's mostly java uh, centric but i think it can be used for for other languages as well but it provides a better way to build uh, images without using the docker daemon at all it just takes uh, an artifact like the um, the war files uh, the dhs2 war files and basically <clears throat> adds it to a base image uh, like the tomcat base image that we use and this simplifies things by a lot and uh, makes uh, the image much more simple uh, secure and easy to maintain and uh, it's also a very good idea to, to use verified base images in our case we use a tomcat uh, base image <clears throat> so we don't have to worry about uh, securing uh, tomcat uh, it's already done by the tomcat developers on their own so <clears throat> it's uh, it's a very nice and easy way to to do the right thing basically and uh, with jeep now uh, <clears throat> the latest images that we have been building uh, there as i said built with jeep uh, this really helps and makes the boot time of dhs2 faster uh, notably before dhs2 in docker was uh, booting uh, rather slowly and by slowly i mean uh, you're talking about minutes so this is now greatly improved and it's uh, kind of a half a minute boot time which is a big improvement and uh, also, this is uh, something uh, <clears throat> that we can uh, <clears throat> be proud of, I guess. And uh, the Docker images now are a lot more secure, I said, as I said. This is, uh, again, partly due to using JIP uh, for building them, as well as some changes that we've made uh, recently with uh, the sole purpose of just improving the the security within the, the Docker images. <clears throat> um, before going into the next uh, topic, which will be Kubernetes, I again want to ask if somebody maybe have any questions right now, they want some clarification or anything. Well, don't maybe, maybe a quick question. Yes. Um, have you considered not bundling the DHS2 into the image at all and just running the the kind of secure verified Tomcat image and providing the exploded war file as a as a volume? Because it strikes me that you know you make very big images, <laughs> um, and particularly yeah. if you're exploding the war file within it. Um, and if you're running, if you're trying to run, for example, a a load sharing environment with multiple Tomcats, it uh, my inclination would have been to just provide the war file or the or the exploded web app as a volume. What is the thinking behind going the way you've gone? Uh, well, I suppose that uh, what you're saying here with the exploded war. Uh, within a volume this is uh, kind of it is a way to go about it but uh, i suppose it's not the the most uh, efficient way yes the images are maybe bigger right now than they would be if we would be <clears throat> providing just a tomcat image and exploding the war uh, separately um, but um, the idea here is that uh, you just get uh, a dhs image and if you have Docker, it's very easy to start DHS2. It's basically about uh, simplicity and uh, yeah, 
It depends on the use cases, of course, uh, as you said, on certain environments where you would be running multiple DHS2 uh, image, uh, multiple DHS2 containers, uh, and uh, <clears throat> there might be better ways to go about it. But uh, maybe you were kind of referring to uh, a Linux container environment where you have uh, multiple uh, separate uh, virtualized uh, <clears throat> environments within the same server, and uh, no, 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 not really. Rather, I'm just thinking of, yeah. of 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 running a simple a simple Docker environment, but where you don't you don't put the web app into the image, so you don't you don't have a DHS two Docker image as such. You just have a Tomcat image. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that it's probably simpler the way it is, and you just download your Docker image and run it. Um, I, th I think so, Bob. And I, I think another kind of point is we want to we want to recommend an image that we've tested. Um, and I think if we obviously we could then recommend a specific uh, Tomcat image uh, with the with DHS2 um, uh, sort of linked to that. But I think, you know, if we if we compose this together, uh, into a DHS2 image, then exactly what we've tested is exactly what um, is in production. So I think there's an element there too that it's 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 simpler to manage that um, uh, as well. But I think it's interesting your <laughs> the the solution as well. And it is. Yeah, no, I was just wondering what, what the rationale was, whether people considered doing it the other way, but. Oh, good. I mean, I understand why it is the way it is. Yeah, yeah uh, I, 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 pre guess... I presume you, you do explode the war file in the Docker image then. So what you download yeah, is... The, the, the image is, has uh, an already exploded uh, war file in there. And uh, the, the <clears throat> basically the explosion of the exploding of the war file does not happen um, in boot time. So this is one of the reasons uh, why the boot time of DHS2 is now much faster. Uh, mm -hmm. Before, uh, the way we built images, uh, the, the war was exploded uh, every time you start the image. So this added um, <clears throat> some overhead uh, when booting and it just uh, made things a bit slower. Uh, so now we have a pre-exploded war basically within the, within the image. Yeah, there's also good security reasons for doing that as well. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Sorry, so didn't, mean, didn't, from, uh, didn't mean to interrupt your flow. <laughs> no, no, of course. Uh, I just felt like I'm going maybe a bit too fast through the through the slides, and uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, Kubernetes. Uh, why do we uh, even want to to go there? Why do we want to to use Kubernetes at all. Uh, as I said uh, in the previous slides, we do have a lot of servers and a lot of DHS2 instances running. So this is kind of a, <clears throat> uh, a natural decision to go there because uh, uh, Kubernetes is kind of the, the go-to orchestration platform for, for containers. And you get a lot of stuff for free uh, once you uh, get going. Uh, <clears throat> of course, there's no free lunch, uh, but maybe it's a, a cheap lunch. Um, <clears throat> it takes uh, some time to uh, to properly um, <clears throat> um, have uh, to properly create your infrastructure to to run Kubernetes, and uh, it just takes a bit of time to. Uh, learn the, the management things uh, that are behind it. But uh, once you go there, it's uh, pretty much very easy uh, from that point on. And you do get a lot of stuff for free. Uh, notably, <clears throat> you get uh, like load balancing, uh, proxying and ingress management uh, for free, which uh, you don't even have to think about as a developer. Uh, we, as the DevOps engineers, are the ones that take care of this, and uh, the DHS2 developers uh, can pretty much just 
deploy their uh, applications, DHS2 applications, and uh, not have to worry about any of this. Of course, uh, with uh, uh, ingress management, you also get uh, SSL termination and uh, <clears throat> yes, and um, also scalability, uh, both horizontal and vertical. Scalability is possible, maybe vertical is a bit more uh, limited, but uh, horizontal scalability is uh, what you really is one of the kind of the main uh, selling points of uh, Kubernetes. It's really easy to scale your uh, container applications. It's very easy to, <clears throat> to handle more traffic and so on. And this, uh, if you have the proper uh, configuration and setup, this pretty much happens uh, automatically. You don't have to do anything. If you have more demand, then you get more, uh, more applications running, more servers running and so on. <clears throat> so this really helps uh, with uh, the current number of servers that we have. Uh, as I said in the beginning, we are somewhere in the hundreds of DHS2 instances. And some of these are running all the time, even though they don't have to. So within Kubernetes, uh, this is very <clears throat> basic problem to solve. Um, with uh, automatic uh, automated scalability, you just, as I said, you get as much as you need pretty much. And <clears throat> you also get a lot of packages for uh, pre-made software for free. Uh, <clears throat> like uh, you can very easily install uh, logging patch packages like the Elk stack, uh, Grafana stack and so on. Uh, this also goes for, for metrics. This, uh, these two stacks that I mentioned also provide uh, metrics, uh, <clears throat> tracing and so on. Pretty much you can easily install anything else that you might need within your Kubernetes cluster besides the main application of interest which in this case is the DHS2. And if you do it, uh, it's also easier to, to have your infrastructure as code. Um, pretty much everything uh, in Kubernetes is a YAML file. So it's uh, a lot easier to, to manage. And I did skip to the next slide uh, and gave you a, <clears throat> a sneak peek, but yes. There is a lot of complexity with Kubernetes, uh, but maybe the reputation kind of precedes the reality. And the reality is that with uh, a couple of tutorials and uh, some workshops and just some extra time, it's uh, really easy to, to get um, started and get you along with. So it's not as serious, people say. it's not as hard as people say. Yes, it is hard, but uh, it's also <clears throat> hard to run without Kubernetes. Uh, the number of servers that we currently have, uh, it's, it's unimaginably hard to, to manage, uh, let alone by just a few people. And uh, it's kind of really easy to, <clears throat> to, to not notice uh, uh, issues in time and uh, so on. So clusters are indeed complicated, but it's a lot more complicated uh, running a big uh, infrastructure as our own uh, without uh, Kubernetes. So as I said, it was kind of a natural decision for us to, to go there with the whole push to run the IHS2 in Docker. And yeah, this, this is what I have uh, prepared for you today, guys. Uh, I suppose now it's a uh, Q&A time. So hopefully this was uh, <clears throat> somewhat useful for you, maybe really useful. If you have any questions, you can either ask now or reach out to uh, any of us later, either in the community of practice or in the development Slack. Yeah. Okay. Q I have time. a quick question, Rado. Um, yes. I'll take you back to the, the Docker um, images and stuff. So I, I would like yeah. to know if you you just build your own images or or you start from um template like tomcat image and then you 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 build your your, your own custom images and then where are you hosting those images so yeah and we do use uh, 
a verified base image. We use uh, the Dom Tomcat um, verified image. So currently, I think we uh, we promote uh, Tomcat 9.0 uh, as the main stable version, but we do also have uh, 8.9 uh, that we built. But <clears throat> uh, yeah, and uh, as I said, with JIP, which is the build tool that we are using, we don't even have to to build the image with the Docker daemon. Uh, I don't want to go into too much details, but basically how it works, it you get the base image, the Tomcat base image, and uh, you add an extra layer with the the DHS to war within it, and you're good to go. So this is how we we build the images, and uh, we host our images on Docker Hub. You can find them uh, on I think the user yeah the username is DHS, and we have both core and core dev repositories which uh, i suppose <clears throat> the name reveals what they are so yeah thank you another one is um with kubernetes uh, do you uh for instance have um two applications say demo you have two instances of demo and um how is load balancing handle are they going are the two applications going to write the same database? Uh, no. So we <clears throat> right now we use uh, basically uh, single instance deployments within Kubernetes. They are not load balanced. So um, every DHIS to every DHIS to instance has its own database. Um, we do have it as a plan in the future, but uh, I mean. It's not really a very common use case where you have uh, load balanced uh, DHS two instances uh, using the same database. So this is not our main focus right now, but it is something that we would like to explore and uh, develop more in the future. Yeah, right. I was gonna, I was gonna ask a little bit around that as well. But um, first of all, thanks for the presentation, and which you know, I know you yes. give a very, very short notice. <laughs> Um, Thanks as well for inviting me. Now, when I think about your, your primary challenge, and it's really to do with, you know, running hundreds of instances, so it's, it's, it's quite a complex operation. Um, but you, you are less concerned, I guess, about the data. I mean, data is because they're mainly for demo purposes or for testing purposes and the like. Right. Yeah. If I compare the two, probably many of the people on this call they will have less instances typically i mean a typical national setup you might be talking about three to ten different dhs2 instances but in those in most of the production cases i guess it's the it's the database side of it which is much more critical in lots of ways um is it on the database side that we tend to find most of the performance issues but also it's the database which you know um contains the 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 assets which need to be protected and and the like can you tell us a little bit more about you know what you're doing on the database side have you done any any performance scaling work in terms of you know database replication and you know load sharing on the database side so to start from, from the back, uh, database replication and load sharing, this is not something that we have explored, uh, at least to my knowledge. Maybe if you can, can correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> but uh, yes, it's, uh, you're very right that uh, usually um, implementations are very data heavy and the databases there are very big compared to our internal usage of DHS2 where databases are smaller we have pretty much the sierra loan database a <clears throat> some other specific uh, databases uh, related to hmis uh, lmis and so on uh, but indeed our internal <clears throat> struggles are somewhat different to the implementations out there still with the performance uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. 
okay maybe this was <clears throat> just a mic check so yeah um as i was saying with the performance databases that uh, we are using for for testing we are kind of trying to to mimic uh, <clears throat> the real implementations right there uh, right uh, that are out there but of course it's uh, not a one to one comparison because uh, even do even though we do have uh, very large performance databases some of the implementations out there are much larger and uh, it's actually hard to to get uh, realistic uh, data um, given that this uh, health information uh, system um, it's not also not uh, easy to to just ask implementations to provide their database even if it's uh, anonymized and so on it's still a challenge so <clears throat> i think i, I uh, think there's... yes I, I think i can complement that or rather what you're saying um in terms of answering bob uh i think one point is we're still quite early in in the sort of transition to to kubernetes right so although we've been doing some of those things um kind of manually or in our previous setups um we're trying to get the sort of kubernetes setup right first before we start expanding on the the different sort of configurations that we can support but i think we will want to support those sort of configurations uh, if not only for testing and exploring um those those areas and improving and optimizing uh our own guidelines for for these kind of use cases yeah indeed <clears throat> i mean uh maybe it wasn't really clear from from my presentations but as few said we are uh, kind of uh, early into going into kubernetes uh, even though we have uh, a lot uh, of things uh, available and usable right now it's uh, nowhere near complete so we still have a lot of things to explore and figure out and um, as Phil said uh, our main uh, first goal was to just um, <clears throat> serve the internal development uh, needs uh, that we have and then we can kind of look further both into performance testing uh, database development and so on so I don't know if yeah. But this really answered your question, Bob. But uh, yeah, no, he, yeah. he does. I, mean, I was interested. I think what I got from what Phil was saying as well that um, the intention is that the performance testing stuff, some of what I know Gintari set up on sort of separate machines, the the yeah. hope would be that that will also come under the the umbrella eventually as part of the kind of Kubernetes infrastructure as code setup. Yeah, indeed. Um, and you know, I, I said that most of the national implementations wouldn't be the, at the scale in terms of number of DHS two instances, but there are in fact quite a few actors who, who, who run a lot. I don't know if there's anyone from HISP South Africa on, but I know they they probably run in the hundreds of instances. Uh, I see Dajo is here from HISP Western Central Africa. They don't directly run many instances, I don't think, but they're certainly assist to quite a number of countries running a number of instances so um yeah this question of how to manage many dhis2 instances um it's not irrelevant for for country implementations at all I mean, yeah. rwanda has at least 12 i think maybe more yeah i mean probably kubernetes is a bit of a, a stretch for for even the Kind of the implementations that uh, run uh, a lot of instances but for internal for our internal usage it just made sense uh, but uh, nonetheless uh, just uh, running dhs to in docker maybe through docker compose because uh, at that point in time docker compose is even recommended for production i think this is a very decent and scalable way to, to run multiple dhs to instances in a very controlled manner what about the security management of Docker images? This is always this has been always my reluctance in a way. I mean, in your case, for example, most of those instances are quite ephemeral, right? They don't last long. They're they're, they're cattle, as you say. 
Um, yeah. for, for, for long running instances, you have to have a mechanism to ensure that your, your, your Docker image is secure and remains secure you know, in terms of things like, you know, operating system updates or Java updates or, or things like that that might come along. What's your yeah. strategy of dealing with Docker security in that sense? So I guess uh, our strategy is just uh, following the, the best practices, not running the images root, running just uh, one uh, process within the image. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> since we started building our images with JIP, I think they're much more secure than they used to be. At this point, as I said, we are just using a verified Tomcat image, which is uh, tested a lot by the Tomcat development team. So <clears throat> I think we can kind of- But if there's a security the release on the base image, for example, there's some yes. some, some major flaw in Tomcat and then, and then, then yeah. Tomcat produces a new image tomorrow. Do we have a process around that? To... Uh, we don't really have a process with automated process about that right now, but it's still kind of, uh, we do keep an eye on those base images that we use. So uh, <clears throat> if there's some big security issue, we would know about it. And we would uh, basically just build new images uh, based on the new <clears throat> image that uh, Tomcat uh, releases. Uh, but some of the challenges, security challenges that you said, like keeping uh, the operating system and so on updated, these are still challenges regardless of whether you uh, run DHS2 in Docker or uh, just as a standalone war file. You still have to kind of secure your own infrastructure, the service mm. where you're running them. So this doesn't really change uh, too much of what you have to do with hardening your uh, on infrastructure where you're running DHS2, but it does provide kind of a, a layer of security for DHS2 itself. And uh, Gerald had uh, two questions. Uh, <clears throat> Jin Sanga too, I'll first go to Gerald. Uh, he's asking, are you building DHS to work on Kubernetes? Uh, yeah, we are building DHS2 uh, <clears throat> Docker images to run both uh, in Kubernetes or in Docker Compose, uh, whatever orchestration uh, tool that you want to use. Uh, I think it's <clears throat> pretty much the same. The images are usable anywhere that you can run Docker on. And uh, he's also asking whether during deployments, the pods, uh, uh, are the pods restricted to use specific IPs uh, because he sees that as a challenge? And no, I don't think we uh, use any static IPs for the pods. They pretty much get a new, <clears throat> new both uh, internal uh, private IP and public IP for for each new pod that is run. So the the IPs are basically recycled. And Chinsanga is asking, what do you say is the best way to scale a DHS instance vertically or horizontally? Uh, well, depends on whether we are talking about uh, running DHS2 in Docker or outside of Docker. If we are talking about uh, DHS2 running uh, inside Docker um, vertically, of course, you just have to have a bigger machine uh, if you if you're talking about uh, running within Kubernetes, then there's this thing called the vertical pod autoscaler, which can, uh, depending on conditions that you uh, care about, like traffic and so on, uh, <clears throat> resource usage, you can increase the size of uh, the nodes that run the DHS to uh, pods. So this also happens automatically. Uh, same goes for horizontally, which is even easier. Um, <clears throat> of course, as I said, uh, in the context of DHS2, we do not uh, currently load balance multiple uh, DHS2 instances uh, to use the same database. So uh, horizontal uh, kind of scaling is, uh, it's not something that we uh, are doing right now. Uh, maybe we will start uh, doing it in the future. And if you're talking about uh, scaling outside 
of Docker. Um, then again, it's uh, I suppose the best way is just to to get a bigger server, which does sound easy uh, in words, but uh, can be challenging in practice, I suppose, especially if you're talking about country implementations where you can have a fixed uh, number of resources and so on. Running, uh, sorry, what if you are running a cluster of servers and say you have two servers right now and in future you want to add another one to the, to the cluster? How is that going to help in, in, in uh, scaling? Is it going to be vertical? Um, so right now uh, we are using uh, automated, uh, automatic uh, <clears throat> cluster scaling. So uh, the number of nodes or servers that we have within the cluster depends on the kind of the demand. So if there is uh, no demand at all and we are just running kind of the core services that keep the cluster going, we usually have one or two servers running at uh, at any time, and if there's more demand, if there's more demand, it kind of grows to three, four, five, again depending uh, <clears throat> on the demand. But this happens automatically, and we don't really have to to think about it. And this and, is uh, and how do you monitor the scaler? Sorry, how do you monitor the the demand uh, patterns? Uh, we don't really monitor the demand patterns. We just uh, kind of leave the cluster out of scaler to do its own thing. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about the patterns because it happens automatically. Um, <clears throat> we are still early in the Kubernetes uh, usage, as I said. So uh, with uh, increased uh, developer, <clears throat> with uh, more people, more developers, uh, using the, the Kubernetes cluster and uh, DHS to in Docker. Uh, internally, we are probably going to start looking into usage patterns and, uh, and <clears throat> have some way to, to deal with it. But at this point, it's not something that we have to really worry about. Yeah, I, I, BAO have got quite a bit of experience with horizontal scaling and one of our yeah. Plans in, in one of the weeks ahead, we're going to invite someone from BAO to tell us a little bit about how their experience has been. So that would be interesting. Well, yeah, that would indeed be very interesting. I think uh, BAO have a lot of uh, relevant experience with uh, managing and uh, <clears throat> running DHS to um, as a service for for people. So they do have a lot of knowledge that everyone no, in the community, including the developers. We, we definitely plan to get them on here in, yeah. in one of the coming weeks. Yeah. Good. Okay, Moses has a question. Where do we see DHS in the next 10 years? I see it's becoming versatile like self-updating apps like Android and iOS. Uh, I don't think if, I don't think I'm the best person <laughs> to talk about DHS in the next 10 years. Uh, maybe if you can talk a bit more about the, the future roadmap, but uh, yeah, indeed, the future is uh, bright for DHS2 for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really good question. <laughs> um, there are elements where we are trying to make it easier and easier to be able to update um, DH, DHS2 or components of DHS2. I think uh, most of the, you guys here are probably aware of our of the shift over the last couple of years towards continuous delivery apps, as we call it, so that apps can be uh, updated independently. Um, there are some uh, kind of uh, designs over the next years to uh, give more uh, flexibility in the sort of backend ar architecture to to make it even easier to kind of extend. Uh, things in a similar way and to update things in a similar way in the back end. So I think we're definitely moving in in that, uh, you know, that direction of of the versatility. But uh, there's a balance, right, in, in terms of making things rem remain robust um, and secure as well. So, uh, yeah, but we will yeah, I think the, I think the, the other thing that we, we are likely to see um, is the breaking down of the application into more of a kind of microservice architecture. We, we've, DHS2 has been this 
large monolithic application for some time. And I know like some of the lead architects like Austin are, are, are actively looking at ways of breaking down separate breaking down the application into more more separate services which of course will add to the complexity which is why it's really important that we we um, learn from experiences like like you guys are going through um, because we'll we'll find dhs2 becoming a much more flexible application but equally a more complex application to manage That's my crystal ball gazing for the day. Yeah. Uh, so Moses also asking why is development mobile, uh, why is uh, mobile app development concentrated on Android and stopped on iOS? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you know the the main uh, user base uh, is with Android uh, in terms of mobile, yeah. uh, and that's one of the the reasons why the primary focus is is there. Um, there has been, you know, some support of um, sort of progressive web applications, which means that things work on mobile devices uh, from the web as well. So there, it, I think it's considered that that will provide some of the support for other mobile devices. But um, I think it's still considered that the, yeah, the, the primary use case is, is Android. That, that's the availability of devices in the field as far as we're aware in most cases. I don't know whether Bob can uh, <laughs> um, comment on that. Or... No, I think you said it all, Phil. I mean, the interesting thing about, about Apple or I, uh, iPhones and I, is that senior people in government tend to have them. Um, this is certainly the case I know in, in, in Asia, people tend to like places like Vietnam. Every, everybody above a certain age uh, pay grade will be on 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 Apple, and everybody below that pay grade will be on Android. <laughs> mm. uh, and so sometimes the call the call for iOS support from from East Asia is quite strong. Uh, but yeah, I think the footprint of Android generally in our world is is much much larger. Yeah, that's currently at least that could change. Yeah, probably not going to change, but uh, it's a, Moses is also not... asking, do we, sorry, Bob. No, no, carry on. Um, Moses also asking, do we expect uh, DHS to web application becoming full-time offline like on Capture App, but on web? Um, I, you know, I think we've been trying to increase the support, uh, the offline support in different apps. So I, I think that will continue to improve. Uh, yeah, so, you know, it will always require a connection uh, eventually um, in order to kind of uh, send in the, the data and, you know, get back data. But uh, definitely we've been trying to, to increase the, the offline support because um, we know that's a, a really important factor in a lot of um, implementations in the field. Yeah, thank, thank you too for the questions, Moses. I think they were very <clears throat> helpful. Okay, yeah. So uh, it's uh, at the top of the hour. Th thank you, Rado, for the really informative session. So yeah, I, thanks a uh, lot for, for inviting me, guys. I, it was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, hopefully the presentations and the Q&A uh, that we just had uh, had some good insight and I was uh, helpful to you. So yeah, as I said, uh, if you do have any other questions, uh, please reach out to us and uh, we'll try to help. Sure. Thanks, Rana. What we're hoping to do next week um, is we talk a little bit about, about troubleshooting and monitoring with, with Glowroot. So if anybody's interested in that, currently that's what we're thinking we'll, we'll, we'll have the topic for next week. Sounds good, Bob. Yeah, thank you. And uh, at that point, thanks everyone. Thanks, Tito. Thanks, Rado. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.
बाय बाय